Good morning, Christ Church Pontown. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's risen from the dead from Oxford, Maryland, on the east coast of the United States. And if you're tuning in as a guest on our YouTube channel, uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Jeremiah, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, service of Christ Church Pinetown. Of course, we're scattered, and it's it's an historic service in some ways because I imagine this is probably the first Reach South Africa service that's being led on U.S. soil, and that just goes to show that these are crazy, unprecedented times. But we're thankful for the technology that enables us to meet like this. And um, as we always do, let's begin with the short word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we would much prefer and we long to gather together in person in your son's name. And yet we're thankful for the technology that enables us to meet like this. We ask this morning that you would help us to hear your voice the voice of the living God, Father, Son, and Spirit, speaking to our very hearts this morning. Help us to find comfort in Jesus, our Good Shepherd. Soften our hearts so we would respond to him in repentance and faith. And we pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Well, in the midst of a world that's getting crushed by the coronavirus, and it is getting crushed, is there any comfort? Well, the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism, and a catechism is really just short questions and answers uh, articulating what we believe as Christians, it's the Christian faith. It asks, what is your only comfort in life and death? And in a moment, we're going to encourage each other by saying the answer together. Before we do, just take a moment to reflect on the answer. And then in a moment or two, um, I'll ask the question and lead us in saying it together. By the way, this, this is not a man-made doctrine. It comes from the Bible. What is your only comfort in life and death, Christ Church Pinetown? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Those are great truths that we need to be reminding each other of during this difficult time. It's also great to remember that even though we're scattered, we can confess our sins to God together. It's interesting, recently the Pope made the statement that due to the coronavirus pandemic, it's okay for Catholics, and, and I know I have many Catholic friends, to confess their sins directly to God if there are no priests available. Well, actually, the book of Hebrews tells us that we can always confess our sins directly to God through Jesus Christ because he, Jesus, is our great high priest. See, Jesus, God's king, through his once for all time perfect sacrifice for sins, his death on the cross, he has finished the work needed to make all who trust him right with God, perfect in God's sight. And so it's true that we're great sinners, but we have a great high priest in God's presence on our behalf. And so with that in mind, let's confess our sins to God together. We're going to use, if you have a prayer book with you, we're going to use page two of the blue prayer book. And if not, it'll appear on the screen. Let's say together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done. We have followed our own ways and our own desires, and we have neglected and broken your holy laws. Have mercy on us, Lord. Restore those who repent and confess their sins 
according to your promises declared in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that hereafter we may live a righteous and obedient life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Well, I don't know where you're watching this from, but wherever you are, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins, you can be assured because God says so in his word that your sins are forgiven. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And with that in mind, as children of God, forgiven sinners, let's continue to draw near to him through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to continue to lead us in prayer, mainly for our congregation. Let's bow together. Almighty Father, the coronavirus reminds us that power belongs to you and not to man. And so we ask for forgiveness for so often our first instinct is to look for man-made solutions instead of looking to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for help. Lord, we do ask that you would help us. We give you thanks for helping President Ramaphosa to govern with wisdom during this time. Please continue to give him wisdom to make decisions that would be good for all South Africans. Please give, a, give him courage to follow through with his decisions. And Lord, we pray that you would please help all South Africans to obey the authorities that you have put in place for the good of the whole country. Lord, this is a time of great trial for us. We ask that you would please help us as a congregation to be joyful in the midst of trials, including this lockdown. Please help us families, especially fathers, those of us who lead families and single mothers as well. We ask that you would please help us, help all of us to be kind to one another, our families, to be patient, to be thankful for our families. Because we know, Lord, that a lot of people right now are by force not able to see their loved ones and are isolated and lonely. We pray for those who are lonely or afflicted in any way. Please, would you draw near to them? Lord, we pray also for those who are in need. We pray that you provide for them, especially those in our congregation. And we pray, Lord, Sovereign Lord, please spare those in our congregation, especially those who are vulnerable from the virus. Lord, we also pray that as a congregation, you would help us to lay down our lives for the good of others, not to live for ourselves, but to be willing to sacrifice ourselves and put others first, even during this time. Lord, we just confess that we do not understand your ways. Your ways are higher than our ways. Help us to trust you during this time, that you know exactly what you're doing, that you are in control. Help us to remember and trust that the gospel is unstoppable and it will spread. You will even use this virus to advance your kingdom. Lord, we pray now as we listen to your word that you would give us ears to hear your voice. Keep us from distractions. Speak to our hearts. Help me to proclaim your word faithfully in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, as is our tradition at Christ Church Pinetown, uh, I'm going to read uh, Psalm 23. That's not a tradition, but the tradition is that you're going to say, thanks be to God after I say, uh, after the reading, this is the word of the Lord. By the way, if you're uh, tuning in and, you know, for the first time, you'll be pleased to know that in a normal service, it's not just me who's doing all the talking. Let's listen carefully to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. 
Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, it's hard to believe that about two months ago, our lives were pretty normal. And now, now just look at us. I mean, I'm trying to preach through a computer to you in Pine Town and the surrounding areas as you're locked down in your homes and police and military are apparently monitoring the streets. It's a crazy time and it's happened so fast. You know, January 22nd, U.S. President Donald Trump assured Americans, quote, we have it, meaning the virus, of course, totally under control. Fast forward to today. Now there's about 215,000 coronavirus cases in the United States. By the time you listen to this on Sunday, there will be way over a million cases worldwide. There's been at least 47,000 deaths already worldwide. The numbers are rapidly growing even exponentially growing. People are panicking. Economies are crumbling. Mighty men are fearing. And the once crowded streets are eerily silent. These are troubled, turbulent, chaotic, unpredictable, as you would say, say in South Africa, hectic times, truly hectic. And we may be asking, <clears throat> maybe not out loud, but in our hearts, during these times, does anyone have my back? Is anyone truly committed to me? I don't know about you, but I've found myself looking uh, for someone to say, it's all gonna be okay, you know, looking for comfort, looking for help. And we can look to all sorts of places for comfort and help. Some turn to alcohol for comfort, except that of course in South Africa right now, you cannot buy it. Some turn to Facebook or Twitter to numb our fears with frivolous, funny, or sometimes often not so funny memes. But we all know these are hollow healers. They are impersonal. And because they're impersonal, they cannot care for us. They cannot comfort us. They certainly cannot be committed to us like a person can. Well, what about our leaders? We at least I find myself looking to them, to people who lead us, pastors, presidents, doctors. They may try to help us. They may be doing their best, and we thank God for them. But even the best pastor has limits. Even the wisest president cannot meet or even know our every need. And even the most skillful doctor and caring doctor cannot always heal us. And so the question remains, who's got our back? Who's committed to us during these troubled times? Well, Psalm 23 teaches us that the Lord is. And really, the Lord alone is totally committed to us. There's no one like him who's committed to his people the way he is. The point of Psalm 23 seems to me to be that the Lord is totally committed to each of his people. That's the point of the psalm. And it's great to remember that during this time. In this psalm, we're going to see two pictures. One is in verses 1 to 4. It's the Lord is my shepherd. And then verses 5 to 6, the Lord is my generous dinner host. Some scholars think it's all one image of the shepherd the whole way through. Uh, I don't think we want to do that. It's, it's hard to picture uh, sheep gathered around a table with their forks and knives in verses 5 and 6. But what we do want to do is let this psalm speak to our hearts and encourage us and strengthen our faith in the Lord who is totally committed to each one of his people. And he's committed to you and me personally. You know, this is Hebrew poetry it's not written by a Westerner. Uh, you know, people talk about Westerners being quite individualistic, but just listen to the first three verses. The Lord, David says, is my shepherd. 
He makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores my soul. He leads me. Me, me, me. My, my, my. It's a bit surprising. You would expect uh, David to say, the Lord is our shepherd, Israel's shepherd. But it's much more personal than that. And you know, we need to, to, to be reminded of that during this difficult time, uh, that the Lord personally cares for us. Because, you know, right now, as we're locked in our houses or wherever you might be, you probably have all sorts of personal struggles, family tensions, a difficult spouse, perhaps, financial troubles, troubles finding transportation, troubles finding food. And you've got struggles that are unique to your particular circumstances, and no one may know about them, not even pastors. And so we need to remember that the Lord knows and the Lord cares for you personally right now, wherever you are, especially at this time. And so let's consider how he shows his commitment to each one of us who are his. If you need a refill of coffee, now would be uh, a great time to press the pause button and come back. I'm tempted to do it myself, so please go ahead. But here's the first point in verses 1 to 4. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, for a whole number of reasons, I would prefer if Good Enough was preaching this sermon. One of them is that he has experience shepherding. Not me, as you can imagine. Uh, if, like me, you grew up in the suburbs or the city, you might picture a shepherd as kind of a, you know, a feminine man. He's got glowing, flowing hair, carrying a little lamb on his shoulder, maybe the sun softly shining in. Well, the psalmist David, uh, he was, of course, a shepherd before he was king, and he'd tell you that shepherding is not for wimps. Some of you guys over in South Africa, you've fought in the army. Well, a good shepherd like David would make a good soldier because he bravely put his body on the line to defend his sheep. He killed a lion. He killed a bear to defend them. And of course, in the Old Testament, the shepherd is the ruler of God's people. He's the king who cares for his sheep. And so let's think about how he cares for each one of us. Just notice in verses 1 to 2, firstly, how he provides for each of his sheep's needs. Listen to these verses. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now, I don't know what you think of when you hear those verses. Uh, I tend to think of the beauty of a green pasture. I was just this week went on a walk. It's a beautiful green field. Or when you hear about still waters, we might think it's a picture of peace. And it is. But these are really pictures of the sheep's needs being met. See, to his sheep, green pastures, he's not really uh, analyzing the beauty of the pastures. He's seeing, seeing food and he's lying down content because he's well fed. It's the same for the waters. I mean, picture a sheep trying to drink from the raging Victoria Falls. It's not going to work. He needs still waters to drink. And so the point, it seems, is that the Lord is committed to providing for our needs, each one of us. Spiritual, yes, and material. And one of our great worries, especially now, is, is probably that we run out of stuff, that we don't have enough, that we're in want. And we can live in anxiety, or we can live by faith. And if we live by faith, we'll be able to say with David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, you might be sitting there, wherever you are, thinking, well, that's easy for David to say. You know, he's a king. But let me tell you, David knew times of crisis. If you read 1 Samuel, David was on the run. He's fleeing from King Saul. He's hiding in caves. In 1 Samuel 21, David is all alone. He's hungry, and the priest provides him with bread to eat. It's bread that was normally used for religious purposes. That's how the Lord provides for him. That's how desperate he is. And that David, that desperate David, knows from experience that the Lord is his shepherd. So he can say, I shall not be in want. And I just want to 
encourage us, Christchurch Pine Town. I can testify that the Lord has been our family's shepherd these past two turbulent weeks. As you may know, we left South Africa very quickly. We flew into Washington, D.C., not having a precise plan. We didn't have time to make one. And family members, you know, went out of their way to help us, booked a rental car for us so that we could get here in Maryland. And now here in Maryland, our aunt and uncle, without us even asking, before we even arrived, they stocked the fridge, they stocked the pantry. The Lord's provided for us. He is our shepherd during these difficult times. And he's your shepherd too, um, if you're a child of God, if you're trusting the Lord Jesus. And I want to say, you know, during lockdown, I don't know where you are, what your circumstances are, but if you need food, please don't hesitate to contact Good Enough or Sarah. The Lord often meets our needs through his generous, self-sacrificial people. Now, you'll notice, uh, I shall not want uh, does not mean that God gives me everything I want. We sometimes wish it was that way, but you know, it's not. And if our hearts are restless, we want more and more. Our heart is the problem, not the Lord. And you know, having more stuff will not ultimately make us happy. I used to caddy at a country club up in Connecticut. Uh, wealthy people, a lot of them are very friendly and nice to be around. But there are some people who are totally miserable. Stuff does not make us happy. As the Puritan pastor Jeremiah Burroughs wrote, quote, contentment comes not from having more, but from wanting less. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, if we're not experiencing David's peaceful heart, it might be that our hearts are actually leading us astray. And if that's us, and it probably is many of us, let me encourage you not to despair because the second thing we see here in verse 3 is that the shepherd guides his wayward sheep. Now, as you know, sheep are stupid creatures. And so if the Lord is our shepherd, we're his sheep, which does not flatter us. Uh, sheep are stupid. They're foolish. They wander into danger. And if you're a Christian, you know, as much as we've committed ourselves to the Lord Jesus, it's actually the Lord's commitment to us that sustains our faith, that keeps us Christian. Because like sheep, we do morally stupid things. As we confess from the prayer book, we do things we ought not do. We still have in us a deep ability to do evil. And I don't know about you, but I've had this experience where sometimes, you know, you wander and you think, well, we get frustrated with ourselves. How could I wander from my Lord? And the problem is that we're not really listening to Psalm 23. We think we're strong, committed Alsatians, you know, what we call German shepherds, always loyal to their master by his side. You know, like the Apostle Peter, Lord, I'll never deny you. Well, no, we are actually morally weak, wayward sheep, and the reason we're still Christian is because we're led by a good shepherd, the Lord Jesus. And you know what will happen if we accept that we are sheep prone to wander? Paradoxically, we'll rely less on ourselves. Why would a sheep rely on, a, on himself? And we'll rely more on Jesus, our merciful shepherd. And he is a merciful, good shepherd. You know, when we realize we've wandered off, perhaps you're realizing that right now, we might think the Lord is, he's done with me. He's ready to disown me. And we might think that way because we can be harsh with people who wander, but not the good shepherd. You know, David, who seriously stuffed it up, if you read the Bible, he stuff, stuffed up his life. He knows that the Lord can restore his soul. Even if you're wayward, way wayward, he can restore your soul. He can lead us back to him, to paths of righteousness. And notice he does that for his namesake. You know, we all like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah says, but the Lord has laid on him, on the suffering servant, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And he's ultimately done it for his namesake, so that as his forgiven, restored sheep, 
We'd follow our shepherd's lead. We'd live a righteous life that helps outsiders, people who don't yet know Jesus, see how great he is, that he really is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep, as he said in John 10. You know, now during lockdown, wherever you are, it's obviously stressful times. I would guess that a lot of unbelievers are, are, are really curious how we as Christians are going to act during this time. And may we be led in paths of righteousness and thereby glorify the Lord's name, honor him. Well, let's move on. The third comforting truth from this passage is that Jesus, our good shepherd, protects his sheep from evil. Verse 4, this famous verse, but don't let it pass you by. Listen, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. See, David, unlike many professing Christians, is a realist. He lived in a world haunted by death's shadow. He walked through the valley of the shadow of death. That is genuine Christian experience. Christianity is not just happy, clappy, trouble-free, mountaintop experiences, one after another. And the coronavirus has thankfully swept away, or I hope it's sweeping away, that false version of Christianity that denies that our shepherd would ever lead his beloved sheep through such a dark valley. He does. I mean, where in the Bible? Show me if you can find it. Where in the Bible does the Lord promise us trouble-free lives? I can think of a passage in John 16 where the Lord Jesus promises us trouble in this world, but that we can be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. But trouble-free life, you won't find it in the Bible. And coronavirus should therefore not really surprise us that much, although we don't understand everything God's doing with it. Now, it does make us feel vulnerable as the coronavirus kind of looms over us like invisible darkness. We're like the helpless sheep in verse 4, vulnerable to danger, unable to see what's lurking in the darkness. Any moment, a bear or a lion or a robber could suddenly end it all, snatch the sheep, or for us, a deadly virus. You know, if we're honest, and it's good to be honest with God and with one another, we've probably felt moments of great fear, panic, anxiety. I mean, when I just saw that there's almost a million cases right now, I certainly felt that way. We're scared. You know, it's possible, uh, even as the virus spreads rapidly, to confess with David from the heart, I will fear no evil. It's possible to live without fear of evil. I mean, he's walking through the valley of death. How can David say, I will fear no evil? Well, you can see it right there. For you, the good shepherd, my shepherd, are with me. And that's why he fears no evil. It's not because he found a good doctor. It's not because he secured enough masks or hand sanitizer. Not because the Lord has changed his circumstances and brought him out of the valley, the dark valley. No, David will not fear simply because you are with me, your rod and your staff, they come for me. That's enough for David. That's enough for us at this time. If there's one thing you can take from this talk, it's that the Lord is with us if you're his. That same shepherd is with us. And we know our shepherd is with us in person. We know him more personally than even David knew him. Because Jesus, God with us, as the angel announced before his birth in Matthew 1, he is with us. He's become human. God has become human. Jesus is truly human like us, and he's truly God, which is why he did things that only God can do if you read the Gospels. If you think about it, as God with us, Jesus lived as a human amidst a world haunted by disease and death. He knows what it's like to live in this world and face these things. But not only that, he did something about it. He actually died to defeat death for us and to overthrow all evil. 
See, did you notice in verse 4 of this psalm, Psalm 23, that this shepherd is armed? David would tell us that the shepherd's rod, it's, it's not actually a rod of discipline, not here. It's a weapon for his defense. It's a gun, if you will. We Americans might like that. See, think of if you've seen YouTube videos of those safari guides. I don't know who goes on these crazy safaris where you go walking towards wild animals, but these safari guides have their guns and they're ready to protect those traveling behind them. That's what this shepherd does. And he also uses his staff, of course, with the hook on the end to pull in his sheep from danger. And if you read John chapter 10, which I'd encourage you to do, Jesus, this shepherd, promises in John 10, 29, that, listen to this, no one will and no one is able, he says, to snatch my sheep out of my hand. If Jesus is our shepherd, we are safe. No matter what happens, we're safe. See, he's with us no matter what happens. You know, here in the United States, we've been trading WhatsApp messages with Amy's parents who are about a seven hour drive away. They're both believers. They've both tested positive with COVID-19 in the last week. And you know what? I've been so encouraged, I think Amy has too, by their fearless faith. They don't fear the virus, they don't seem to. And they don't fear it even though Amy's father has cancer. And I think it's because they know that their shepherd is with them to eternally protect them. See, even in the face of death, Jesus, the good shepherd, is with us. And you know, we need to hear that. I don't know if you've been reading the news, but it's tragic to read about these individuals, many who have coronavirus, COVID-19, in Italy or New York or wherever, and they are dying all alone because of fears of contagion. No visitors, not even family, are allowed to visit. But you know, even if doctors, or nurses, or family, or friends, or pastors are with us as we're on our deathbed, they cannot walk with us during that final moment when we breathe our last breath. But even at that moment of death, especially even at that moment, Jesus, the Lord of life, the one who laid down his life so that we could live forever, will be with us if we're his. That's comforting. It's huge comfort. It's the comfort of all comforts, as we confessed in that catechism. He's our only comfort in life and in death. See, because Jesus laid down his life to conquer death, and he did it for his sheep, if we trust him to rule us, to shepherd us, if we trust that his death was for me, for my sins, death is not the final word. Death will not ultimately shepherd us. Jesus is our shepherd. He will even raise us from the dead when he returns and give us a resurrection body like his resurrection body to live forever. I hope someone's saying amen to that. And that's why by faith, we can confess, I will not fear coronavirus. I will not fear any evil. I will not even fear death itself. For you, Lord, the one who's conquered the grave, are with me. Just let that sink in for a moment before we look finally at verses five to six, which will keep shorter than what we've done so far. This is the second picture. It's the Lord as a generous hospital dinner, sorry, hospitable dinner host. Hospital. <laughs> I can understand why I thought of hospital, but a generous hospitable dinner host. <clears throat> verses five and six. Now, because of lockdown, uh, I think most of us are kind of in survival mode. And in survival mode, we're kind of rationing toilet paper and canned soup. And so at a time like this, the thought of enjoying a feast, it sounds really appealing. At least it does to me. It's great to be welcomed into a generous host's house. 
you know, an Easter lunch, a table well decorated, decked out with well prepared food and lots of it. I mean, just think about that. Who doesn't love a generous host? Well, David says that you, Lord, are that host. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. It's a feast. I mean, think of the most gracious, generous dinner host you've ever experienced. The Lord himself is even more generous, even more hospitable. David says, verse 5, you anoint my head with oil. If you want to cross-reference, you want to look at Luke 7, it's just good hospitality. Today it would be like, you know, maybe welcoming someone into your house and saying, can I get you a coffee? Can I get you tea? What can I do for you? Sit down, relax. That's what the Lord's like. And notice verse 5b, he's generous. David's cup is overflowing. You know, it reminds me of a Christmas braai with some friends down in Cape Town a few years ago, and uh, the, the food was overflowing and the tea was overflowing. I probably drank about 10 cups of tea from noon to late in the evening. They were so generous. We didn't want to leave. That's what the Lord's like. He overflows with generosity towards his people. It's the opposite of hoarding. It's giving. And, you know, to be generous and hospitable is to be godly. It's to be godlike. And obviously right now we can't open our homes up, but we can give generously and be thinking of those in need at this time. Now, verse 5, this, this picture, it's ultimately a picture of what heaven is like. Not bored, floating around on clouds and playing, uh, you know, kind of harps that are, you know, made of air. Um, it'll be a feast in the Lord's presence. Verse 5 may be a, a, you know, a military feast celebrating a military victory over David's enemies. Whatever it is, the enemies are powerless to stop the feast. I hope you see that. You know, coronavirus, that can't stop the feast. Death can't stop it. Nothing in all creation can ultimately separate us from the Lord. See, we need to, I like that word in verse 6, surely. He's got assurance of this goodness and mercy following him all the days of his life. An assurance of his ultimate future, that it's bright. Apologies for the noise, I can't do anything about it. Now, see, here's the thing, even in the presence of enemies now, we have joyful assurance that the Lord is for us. And so our future is bright. As the Apostle Paul declares in Romans 8:32. He who did not spare his own son, he gave up everything for us. How will he not also, with him, graciously give us all things? See, David is sure, and we can be sure because of the cross ultimately, that the Lord's goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You know, even now, I would guess there's many people who are maybe complaining against God. Well, as believers, we can, even now, testify to the Lord's goodness and mercy. It's because of the Lord's goodness that we're still alive. It may even be that the Lord is showing us mercy through the coronavirus, reminding us of our need for Him. And it's certainly only because of the Lord's mercy, His undeserved kindness to us, His compassion towards us, shown at the cross, that we can dwell and will dwell in his house forever. Let that sink in. You know, I've been reading uh, the South African news each day, and I'm feeling bad for those living in shacks and cramped in houses during this lockdown. You know, if that's you, you know, if you're a believer, that's not your final house. This is the Lord's house forever. And you know, if you happen to like your house that you're locked down in, we all know this world is not the way it ought to be. We long for a better house, for the Lord's house. And here's what we need to hear is that, dear friend, if you're led by David Shepherd, we can say, each one of us can say with confidence, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
See, for the believer, a day is coming when the Lord himself, who's been committed to us all the days of our life, will say, welcome home. Welcome home forever. No food rationing there, feasting with the Lord. Let me close. Dear friend, no matter what happens this week, the Lord Jesus is totally committed to you if you belong to him. That's what Psalm 23 teaches us. Through faith in him, in Jesus, who died in place of his people and is risen from the dead, living now as King and Savior, through faith in him, we can confess with David these three things by faith. I shall not want, I will fear no evil, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me pray. Father, please grant us hearts that receive your word as food for our souls. Comfort us with the truth that Jesus, your son, is our shepherd who will never leave us nor forsake us. Pray this in his name. Amen. Friends, that's the end of our service. And as we close, as you kind of go, maybe to the refrigerator, because you can't leave, uh, or maybe to the shops, let's go with these words from Hebrews 13, starting in verse 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Take care. Amen.